All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, it's interesting here. Uh, you see this uh, once saved, always saved, question mark. Is once saved, always saved true, question mark? Well, the answer is, yeah, it's true. Yeah, that's all you have to say. Well, there really doesn't need to be any more discussion beyond that. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. But you can't honestly squirm your way out of that Jesus says in John chapter 3 verse 36 he that believes on the son has everlasting life okay I mean if you don't understand that that you maybe maybe try reading uh, you know uh, the whole chapter 3 that, that might help or just read the Bible I mean it's overwhelming that Jesus offers us everlasting life. And of course, I always like to point to this conversation with Nicodemus when he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit so once you are born of the spirit of god you will never die you have eternal life everlasting life the second death has no power over you the moment you are born of god and this is overwhelming. I mean, you have to be uh, just not believing to not understand that. And that's, uh, you know, that's what I've been saying day after day over and over and over and over is that we live in a world where people say they believe in Jesus Christ, but they do not believe the Bible that they hold in their hands because they don't believe they don't understand it's pretty simple uh, the and the evidence is overwhelming it's always been about faith it's about faith it's always been about faith and of course I think Ephesians 2 is a great place to go um, you know obviously Hebrews 11 talks all about faith but Hebrews 2 we read for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, and not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's obvious. It's beyond obvious. If you don't understand it, it's because you don't believe. And if you don't believe, of course, you're not going to understand it. And so we that's the world that we live in, the people that don't believe. And so they're trying to contemplate and trying to reconcile and all this sort of stuff. They're trying to twist and squirm and all that sort of stuff. They're trying to deal with this question because they don't believe. And there really shouldn't be any question about it. So I want to talk about uh, this conversation um, with JS, Genesis Designs. All right. So I, I did the video this, yesterday. Uh, yeah, talking a little bit about this, and I, I was so busy I didn't uh, publish it. And so I'm just gonna go over it again. Why not? I could go over it in my sleep. It's not gonna change what the Bible says. So I want to show you what the Bible says in regards to what he's talking about here. If I can remember what he says. Okay. Oh, maybe it was Steve Prophet, 2150. Let me go back here. I've got to collect my thoughts here. All right. Oh, well, let me read this one first here. Okay, so JS, Genesis Design, says, I made none of those claims, and to be honest, I can't say I understand everything about the subject, at least not 100%, but do not claim I don't believe. I simply disagree with what you say it means. Ezekiel, Isaiah both show keeping Torah is part of the kingdom under Messiah. 
Do you keep the Torah that went forth out of Zion when Messiah took his throne there? No, I do not, and neither do you. Uh, and be honest. I love that, man. Be honest. I love that. That's. I believe that. I believe in being honest. I severely believe it. It's incredibly, incredibly paramount that we be honest with ourselves first. Right? Look, I get it. People lie to one another all the time. They lie and lie and lie and they forget to be honest to themselves. And that happens very easily. It starts by being honest with yourself. And honesty starts with the heart. Alright, so let's be honest. Let's be honest here. Let's be honest and let me show you. I, You know, like... I don't, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time. I'm just going to show you one or two, two verses, right? In Galatians chapter 3. No, let me go back here. I didn't want to do that. Uh, yeah, good. Okay. Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. Wherefore the law, which would be, for whatever reason, you're using the word Torah. Okay, so I could dispel that right now. The Torah is not in the Bible. Right. Now, the Torah is not in the Bible. Look at that. Zero results. So where do you get Torah from? It's not from the Bible. You got it because you trust what other men have told you. And because you trust what other men have told you, it's going to hinder your ability to to understand what God says because you don't believe God instead you believe man it's so simple it really is it's that simple Torah is not in the Bible the law referring to the law in the Old Testament wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith but after that faith has come we are no longer under a schoolmaster right because we're no longer under the schoolmaster we're no longer under the law pretty simple basic stuff but I, look i get it either a whole bunch of men out there teaching contrary to that i get it but that's what jesus warns us of deceivers in the last times you consider matthew 24 mark 13 luke 21 many shall come in my name saying that i jesus am christ and shall deceive many these people are deceiving you how can i how can I convince you of that other than to show you what the Word of God says? Beyond that, it's on you, buddy. I mean, it's easier to deceive somebody than it is to convince them they've been deceived, isn't it? And uh, so, look, it's right there. It's right there in front of your face. Whether you believe it or not, that's on you. You debate it until you turn blue. It ain't going to change the Word of God. It ain't going to change the truth. The truth is not subjective. It's objective. Okay. All right. So that, that should settle that, right? You don't keep the Torah. If you could keep the Torah, then Jesus died in vain. No, nobody can keep the, the Torah, the law. Nobody can. Nobody has. Only Jesus is the only one that never sinned. All right. He's the only one. And he's the one that did all the works of God required 
for salvation, for everlasting life. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He is our shepherd, right? We are the sheep. We follow him. We put all our trust in him. He's done it all for us, right? And we, because we can't do it on our own. We can't. The law shows us that we can't do it on our own. The law reveals our iniquity. Now consider this. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Wow. That's incredible, man. It's not just words on a paper, man. It is a living spirit. Whew. Wow. That's powerful. Powerful stuff, right? So, the law reveals that in our own heart, that we need a Savior. You fight it all you want, but it's the absolute truth. And in, until you realize that, you're in trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. You can't do it on your own. You can't. That's why we need a Savior. And this, of course, goes all the way back to Genesis. And it's... Uh, it's uh, revealed, I guess, in the, all throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. We need a Savior. Thanks be to God that we have one. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. Here. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. He's done the work for us. Okay. Oops. Yikes. I don't know what's going on here. Okay, so let's go back. Um, he, asked, he asked a very good question. How would you explain the thousand-year timeline? And, of course... Um, I just like to try to make it simple and walk the viewer through the the timeline of the last days. The time that we're in now to the time of the end, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's very, very simple. So in a nutshell, at any moment now, Jesus could come in the clouds of heaven and we will we that are saved will be lifted up and the unsaved will be gathered at our feet and they will be killed those of us that are lifted up we are transformed into our glorified body an incorruptible immortal body to meet the lord in the air all right so our enemy is at our feet and we with God, will stomp our foot on the head of the serpent, destroying evil forever. Then there will be set back down on the earth, which will be a new earth and new heavens. And here we have eternal life. All right, and that's it. You you see all these phonies with all these charts and all this rubbish and all this nonsense about a thousand. Bonus years, it's not true. It's not supported by the Bible. And that's why I'm uh, consistently honest. They're teaching comic book fantasies. And why is this so important? It's because it, what are you putting your hope 
into. Why do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus for eternal life. Meanwhile, all these preachers are preaching this idea of, of a bonus thousand years. And it's not biblical at all. And I, I can show you. Revelation 20, as clear as day, never makes any mention of Jesus reigning a thousand years. It's incredible. People don't care. All right, so let's get on to this uh, uh, great conversation here, by the way. Um, uh, let's see. So you lost me in your first statement as an insult to the translation. I've got several translations, and I don't believe in none of it. So you're not going to understand any of it. JS, come on, buddy. That's the point that I'm making. I know the Bible I hold in my hands comes directly from God. Without faith, you're not going to understand. And then, uh, of course, uh, Steve Prophet, 2150, he uh, intercedes. He's going to call me a dummy. Let's see. Mister, you don't have a clue. The Bible clearly says there is a 1,000 year rest Sabbath. Then you use yourself as a reference. And I almost spit out my coffee. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious, man. Love that. It's good to laugh, huh? It's good to have a little giggle. And yes, the Bible says Satan is released for a short time after the Messiah has been reigning a thousand years. That's what the Bible says? I, what Bible are you talking about, Jack? <laughs> huh? I almost spit out my coffee right there. Then you said he would cause people to sin? Where'd you get that? Never mind. Arguing with a fool gets no one anywhere. Click, press enter, reply, send, whatever. After saying never mind, that's interesting. You, you thought never mind. Arguing with you're a fool gets no one anywhere. And then click, send it, send that. Even though he said, never mind. If you meant never mind, you would have erased the whole thing. Anyways, that, I appreciate the comment. I do. Go ahead and get mad. Be mad. It's good to get mad once in a while. Get the blood going. It is. I appreciate it. Well, I get mad all the time. And it saves me from drinking a whole bunch of coffee. You know what I mean? I only have to drink two cups of coffee in the morning, and I'm and I get a little bit mad. I'm ready to go. That's good for you. Good for you. Get the blood going. Okay, so let's let's go to Revelation twenty. Let's see. Let's let's focus on this word Sabbath. There were thousand year Sabbath. Okay, let's see. All right, let's let me point. Let me pinpoint it for you, so you can see that he's right and I'm wrong. Oh, wait a second, it's not there. All right. Okay, so I don't know. Let's see. Messiah has been reigning a thousand years. Then he said he would cause people to say, All right, what, I don't know what you're talking about, man. <laughs> Number one. It never says anything about the Messiah reigning a thousand years. I don't. How in the world do you actually read this? How in the world? It's not Christ or the Messiah reigning a thousand years. It's we, they, meaning we. All right, they. Now let's just make it real simple and clear. They live and reign. With Christ a thousand years. They. It doesn't say Christ reigns a thousand years. How? What's a what's a good way to, uh, what's a good parallel or however that, whatever that word is. Let's say, uh, 
Let's use baseball as an analogy. All right, let's see. Uh, Reggie Jackson. Well, he was on the Yankees for, what, seven years? I don't even know. I'm making this up. I can't remember. The long time ago. He lived and played on the Yankees for a thousand years. Or seven years. Whatever. Reggie Jackson played and reigned with the Yankees for seven years. Does that mean that Yankees only played for seven years? Is that, is that a good analogy? Is that fair? I mean, if you look at it that way, you're GD stupid for saying Jesus reigns a thousand years. It never says Jesus reigns a thousand years. Not in verse 4 and not in verse 6. I could read it every single day, and I've been reading it every single day, and it still doesn't say it. It didn't say it yesterday. I checked. I'll check again tomorrow just to make sure. It doesn't say Jesus reigns a thousand years. It says they lived. They shall reign with him. Reggie Jackson shall play with the Yankees for seven years. That doesn't mean the Yankees played seven years. It just means Reggie played seven years. Yeah, I better look that up. I don't, I'm not sure how long he played with the Yankees. Might have been longer. Might have been shorter. I don't know. I just remember 1977. Sitting on my grandpa's lap watching Reggie Jackson hit the third home run in the game. All right. So, anyway, I'll get into that. Loved that. Loved it. Loved it. Okay. So, anyways, who cares? Um. So, uh, you know, never mind. Arguing with the fool gets no one anywhere. We well, want to argue, even though it doesn't say it. If you argue enough and you know, politic it, may get some politicians to change what this says. He argue it in order to get the laws changed, don't you? And that what politics is all about, getting people divided against one another and convincing rich people to change the laws. Maybe you can do that with the Word of God. Huh? No. It doesn't work. It's not going to work. You might think it worked. You might think it'll, will, it will work. But it doesn't work. It's not subjective. The Word of God is not subjective, it's objective. Alright, so, uh, for some reason, I don't know why, uh, somebody was saying something about, oh, I know what it was. Alright, so are we good here? Are we good here? I wanted to walk through uh, Daniel chapter 9, because there are people that are incredibly arrogant and at the same time incredibly ignorant it's amazing that's pretty and thing saying thing to say dang thing the king james bible is better than anything written in greek or hebrew if you don't understand that you don't understand the word of god well, that's a pretty insane thing to say, because I want to be able to go to these foreign languages and change the Word of God to say whatever I want it to say. And I don't believe in none of it anyway. Pretty insane to believe the Bible that you hold in your hands comes from God. That's insane. <sighs> Goodness sakes. That's insane. Word of God, it, I mean, it, this stuff never changes. I checked this yesterday. I checked it a little bit ago. I'll check it again and see what it says here. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, 
and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God is a discerner of the intents of the heart. It's not just words on a paper. Man, this is not an old Harry Potter book. You're telling me you got to go back? I mean, what's interesting to me, and I'll point this, I pointed this out before many, many times, and I'll, I'll continue to point it out. People will say, you can't rely on the 1611 King James Bible. You can't. You can't rely. It's too old. It's archaic. It's old English, and you can't understand it. Right? You can't understand this stuff. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's too hard to understand. So what we got to do, so what we got to do is go back to the Greek and the Hebrew, which is a whole lot older, way older than the 1611 English. And you don't know Greek, and you don't know Hebrew, and neither do the scholars that pretend that they do. Okay? I'm telling you, they don't. Nobody is born into that language. They pretend as best they can to understand it. But these are dead languages. Koine Greek and ancient Hebrew are dead languages. Koine Greek is not the same as modern Greek. And ancient Hebrew is not the same as modern Hebrew. And what it, look, why would you have to go to these foreign languages to know what God says? It's weird, isn't it? And especially in the light of the fact of what the word, oops, what the word of God says. When you consider with stammering, with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak unto this people and then of course in 1 Corinthians 14 in the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people and yet for all that will they not hear me saith the Lord men of other tongues and other lips the word of God transcends all languages for all time forever and ever it's amazing. Consider Acts 2. How hear we? How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Wow. Every man could hear the word of God in their own tongue. Let's see if I can find something here. Dog biscuit. Now, I, I, can't, I can't understand how I screw this up. Now, I did it. I did. I put, hen, look at the, why? Why doesn't this not? Isn't this odd? Well, now it did. Maybe I'm crazy. I thought it said zero. Whatever, whatever. I need some more coffee. All right, then Isaiah 59. As for me, and this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. All right. I feel like I'm going in another direction. I wanted to go focus on Daniel 9, but here, this is good stuff. Here in Zephaniah chapter 3, for then in the resurrection will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. In the resurrection, we will have a pure language. We won't be speaking English. We won't be speaking 
Greek. We won't be speaking Hebrew. We won't be speaking Japanese. All the languages that are spoken of today will be done away with and we will speak a pure language. Consider that it wasn't until after the flood of Noah that God confounded the language. So he split apart the languages and made several languages. He confounded it, confounded the language. So nobody could understand the original language. So the original language wasn't pure, but it got confounded. And now we live in a world with many languages, but there's a coming a time when all that will be done away with and we will all speak a pure language. All right, that's coming. So all the languages that have ever been spoken in the world will be done away with forever. Knowing that, then you ought to know just from common sense, just simple logic, that the Word of God transcends all languages for all time, forever and ever, and it's quite ridiculous. If you're being honest with yourself, it's ridiculous to say, Oh, well, God can't speak English. God only speaks Hebrew and Greek. And so we got to try to figure out what these languages are saying. I mean, nobody's born into these languages that only God speaks. And it's a bizarre, weird religion that you're practicing. You don't believe in God at all. Let's, I gotta check something here. I just want to see. Just curious. Just for curiosity's sake. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. I want to see if it says the same thing it said two seconds ago. So let's see. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints of marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It says the same thing it did two seconds ago. It said the same thing yesterday also. It's amazing. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. But you have to learn foreign languages to be able to understand it. No, no, no. That's ridiculous. These people, they don't believe in God at all. Why, you know, how, how in the world would you let them persuade you? They don't believe in God by their own words. They don't believe in God. So why would you be persuaded by them? Unless, of course, you didn't believe either, right? Those of us that believe in God, we know that we can trust the Bible that we hold in our hands. We know that these words come from God and not from man. And we don't need to learn foreign languages to know what God says. God speaks, us, speaks to us directly. Just as God spoke directly to Moses, God speaks directly to us in his word. The word of God, the Bible that we hold in our hands. I feel like I better stop now because uh, if I, you know, I was going to talk about uh, Daniel chapter 9. Uh, Mister, you're dumber than dog do. Thank you, Steve Prophet. I appreciate that. I like, I like people that get passionate. I do appreciate that. So you lost me, lost me. Now I'm confused. I don't know nothing. Okay, all right. All right. oh, so anyways, I'm not going to go find it because I might get started on it. But I just want to say, just let me say it. Just let me say this real quickly. All right. In Daniel chapter 9. Okay. The vision that Gabriel explains or shares with Daniel. 
the 70 weeks all right the 70 weeks are determined upon thy holy people I'm sorry that that are 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression Jesus did that to make an end of sins Jesus did that and to make reconciliation for iniquity Jesus did that and to bring in everlasting righteousness Jesus did that and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint Jesus the most holy it's Jesus it's pretty simple stuff know therefore and understand it's Jesus Jesus is gonna come and he's gonna fulfill all these things it's Jesus that from going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince which is Jesus shall be seven weeks and three score and it should be 69 weeks the street shall be built again the temple will be rebuilt even in troublous times the temple this is what it's talking about I don't think anybody argues that no I don't think anybody argues that it's the temple it's gonna be rebuilt and Jesus rebuilt the temple Jesus did it he destroyed the temple and then he rebuilt it in three days Jesus did it and of course don't don't forget this is all about Jesus don't let man confuse you this is all about Jesus and the 70 weeks are determined this is a 70 week prophecy that was fulfilled by Jesus and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself See, he lays down his life, not for himself, but for us. He laid down his life for us. And the people, the prince, the Jews, they're the one that came and killed him. They're the one that destroyed the temple. Jesus laid down his life, or he, he gave up, he allowed his temple to be destroyed. And then he rebuilt it in three days, just like he said he would. until you know and he rebuilt it and he ascended to heaven with the promise to return for us and he shall confirm the covenant this is the covenant it's a better covenant that he has made with us based on better promises Jesus did it he shall confirm and he confirmed the covenant with many for one week when he laid down his life and took it back up, he confirmed the promise that he makes for us of everlasting life, whosoever believes in him. It's not rocket science. And, and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the fact, sacrifice and oblation to cease. See, he laid down his life. He's the one that makes an end of sins. He's the one that makes reconciliation for iniquity. He's the one that brings in everlasting life. He's the one that caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination to cease shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, the end of the world, when we are lifted up and transformed into our glorified body, changed from, in, from mortal to immortal, from corruptible to incorruptible that's the consummation when we are finally transformed into our glorified bodies when we are lifted up into the air first the dead in Christ and those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord and when we're up in the air then fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours all the unsaved and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate the unbelievers those without the Spirit of God pretty simple stuff and this is all revealed in the New Testament I mean it's overwhelming all right this is 
you could say this is a little bit of a mystery in the Old Testament, but now that the New Testament has come, it's overwhelming. Overwhelmingly obvious. It's Jesus. And these people <laughs> that uh, that don't that teach something else, I, they're teaching something weird. Yeah, some comic book Hollywood doctrine that w that is uh, really it's revealing that they don't believe in Jesus Christ at all. They don't believe the Word of God at all, even though they say they believe in Jesus, and then they'll get offended when they get challenged. And blah 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 blah. How dare you? You don't understand nothing. I've seen the movie. You should see the movie. Then you'd understand, right? All right. So anyways, that's enough. I wasn't going to even go that far. I'm rambling too much. I'm fired up today, fellas. Fired up.